Very good to know you're still with us. We thank you for your time. Now, we want to take this conversation to the US, bring in the lessons, possibly um, some of the things we can take from the process that has now brought uh, the projected winner to, we wouldn't, wouldn't say the winner, right now but he is he has gotten the highest number of votes until he is formally announced we'll say he is the projected winner of the u.s presidential election joe biden he got uh, three more votes above the needed number of uh, 270 um, required by the electoral college to become the next president of the united states we also have seen how president donald trump has fought the process especially the male um, ballot part of it. He encouraged his followers to go through uh, the physical voting as against the male vote. Also, we know that strong institutions have come up. These we will be discussing with our guests. Uh, we have live in the studio, uh, legal practitioner Akintayo Iwilade. Thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We also have joining us virtually Mr. Emeka Izia Konwa, political analyst. A pleasure to have you join us as well on The Breakfast. Thank you for having me. Okay, oh, we'll, we'll start with you um, in the studio. Strong institutions, that's the conversation a lot of persons have been saying that's coming off what has happened uh, in the US. What lessons are we to be learning when yeah. it comes to that? In fact, I, I, I would think that that's part of the biggest lessons we should, we should take from all that has happened, that the, the, we have seen in a society far away from us, but also part of our world, where political authority and is, uh, that where institutions are not subordinated to the whims of political authority, where we have seen that institutions will necessarily assist political authorities, help political authorities, but only when the political authority has the legitimacy to make demands on institutions. So essentially what we are seeing here is that institutions are in, 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 in the, uh, coming from the US election analysis, institutions have shown that the loyalty, the duty is not to individuals, but the duty is to the society, to the civic authority, and more importantly, to the laws of the land. So that's an important, extremely important lesson for us to learn within uh, our own uh, Nigerian democratic experiment. So you can imagine, just to uh, make it clearer, in perhaps in simpler terms, you can imagine how the powers of, for example, a sitting Nigerian president, you know, we, we, for example, we saw in the US where the sitting president expressly made it clear that he wanted counting of the ballots to stop. He made it clear in public statements. But regardless of that, you saw, we, we saw how the institutions kept, counting. you know, fit with the law. We also saw how the judicial system also responded very quickly to the initial legal challenges. Of course, there, are, there, are, there will still be a bit more legal challenges from what we read. But we also saw how the legal system responded very quickly to the demands of the moment without necessarily and without in any way seeming to pander to pure political or partisan interest. That's another important lesson for us to learn within our own justice system. We saw fidelity to the law. We also saw uh, speed with which, the, uh, uh, which the initial issues that were taken before the courts were uh, dealt with. And again, another lesson that we are seeing is also the triumph of federalism through a true federal system. We saw that at play in the sense that the, uh, most of the balloting, most of the rules guiding the balloting differed from state to state. And we saw that the electoral process was not centrally controlled, that the, the systems have matured so much, the states have matured so much that everything was being coordinated basically from the state level, from the county levels. And, and another important point to take note is that regardless of the partisan authorities in controlling those states. We have seen that, for example, a person who, a state that is, uh, you know, uh, that is traditionally classified, for example, as a Republican state, we have seen how 
they have returned large uh, numbers of votes for a democratic challenger, in spite of the fact that the persons, the officials, are perhaps themselves, the, I mean, the political officials in those states are of a different uh, political party. But we have seen the decency with which the electoral process and the decision of the people is not being interfered with and, and all of those things. So those are very important tidbits that we can take away from. There's a lot of them. Um, I'm going to go to Emeka Ezekonwa now. Uh, your, of course, colleague here has you know, mentioned a lot of lessons that we must learn. Um, my question to you is, will we learn those lessons? Because it, it's not like we don't understand the law and you know, where the loyalty of institutions should lie. But do you think we will actually learn these lessons or we'll just look at them and admire and continue with our own system here? Uh, what, what must we go through as a nation in order to fine tune and to you know, get to where you know, the United States is now um, with regards to respect for institutions and, and the likes? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I don't think the question is whether we're going to learn it or not. Um, I think the question will be when. Um, we really don't have a choice. If we want to keep uh, doing the democratic uh, system of government that we all wish for and we all we all want to continue. Um, we absolutely need to get to that point where we we, we do it right. Uh, but to get there, it's not it's not it's not going to happen overnight. It's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be on ground um, for us to effectively carry out a free and fair election. Um, I think I think we're taking the right steps, uh, even though some might say it's it's, uh, it's moving pretty slow. But I think we're heading towards the right direction. We've got to make everything electronic. We've got to have the right infrastructure in place to, to ensure that. Um, um, it's one vote per person. And when I say infrastructure, I'm not just talking about electronic infrastructure. I'm not just talking about voting infrastructure. I'm talking about our police, I'm talking about our judicial system. I'm talking about the, 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 polit the political parties themselves. Um, we we'll have a long right. way to go, but I, I, I'm confident we'll get there. All right, I, I want to ask you, it wasn't completely flawless. There are those, uh, the naysayers, that are uh, saying there seems semblance of the Africanness in quotes, uh, when it comes to the bickering um, in the entire process. The, we had the situation with the mail ballots where Trump, from the beginning, has said, had said, his supporters should not use the mail ballot uh, to vote. They should come in person. And then we see him throwing, throwing uh, some, what some describe as tantrum on uh, social media, going to court on almost everything he could lay his hands on. They are saying that it wasn't completely flawless. How does this, in your thinking, impact the reputation um, of the um, democracy and the election um, process in the U.S.? Yeah, so, you know, the, the Trump factor uh, is not America. It's not, it's not the norm, right? So Trump, Trump is uh, an outlier, I would say. He's, um, he's a once-in-a-lifetime individual. Uh, he does not represent the system. His actions does not represent what, how the system is structured. Um, this, this election in particular, there were a lot of things that happened that were not the norm. If you take Trump out of the picture, let's just forget Trump for a minute. Um, the COVID pandemic made the use of ballot, mail-in ballots a lot more significant than previous, previous elections. We've always had mail-in ballots, uh, but those, those used to be a very tiny uh, fraction of the entire vote. But this election, because of COVID, people didn't want to get infected. People didn't want to go vote in person. So the mailing ballot was um, heavily used by a lot of voters. And, and some of the states were not ready or equipped to handle that much mail. Um, as, as efficient as the US mail is, uh, they were also overwhelmed, you know, because nobody thought it was going to be that, that huge. Uh, so this election, 
when it's not your typical U.S. election. There are, there are issues here and there, of course. Uh, but the institutions, like the, the guest in the studio said, the institutions are very strong. Um, there are a lot of uh, checks and balances. There are a lot of, you know, it's not something one man can disrupt. Um, as much as hard as Trump tries, it's, it's not going to disrupt the, process, the flow of, of, of things, the electoral process. All right. Um, let me let me go back. Let me go to uh, Mr. Iwilade now. The elections November third uh, have seen the highest voter turnout in in U.S. history since yes. 1900, I believe, about 66.9 percent, uh, more than 160 million voters. Yes. Um, we have three years to prepare for our next elections in 2023. Um, what what would you say we must start to do now? in order to get those numbers? Because I know that currently there's a large number of people who are you know, agitated enough to you know, ensure that they uh, partake in that process. But there's a lot of things that always play out here and there that frustrate the process. What must we start to do now? I, I think the, the, the first thing is that we need to go back to the details of the electoral law that was passed by the Senate, but which the uh, president couldn't assent to prior, uh, just before the 2019 elections. There are quite some provisions in that bill as passed by the National Assembly that provide, for example, uh, vote, uh, some sort of electronic process you know, to ensure some more, a lot more accuracy and ease of the balloting process. That's an important step, and I, I just like the, uh, Mr. Emeka, the guest rightly mentioned. Now, there is also need to be a lot of political education, voter education. I believe, of course, that has been going on for, for, for many years. But talking of the very practical things that need to be done. Now, just the to law. interject before you proceed from the um, electronic voting, I, yes. want to, um, infer, I want to relate that to um, what has come up as a result of the pandemic, the male voting that has spiked in the U.S., like yes. um, Mr. Iziakonwa mentioned. You know, do, do you think that, um, in, in spite of that provision, that Nigeria can indeed, uh, before the next election, which is in 2023, build a system that will be flawless enough not to have cases after the process has been completed. Even as, as um, meticulous as the US is, we're still having Trump allege and, fraud. And, that, and that's why my emphasis is on the electronic voting system, not on Mail. the mailing Mail ballot. ballot. I don't even think, we shouldn't even go there because the Nigerian postal system with, that we have failed to develop and make efficient over the years obviously would, does not have the infrastructure to cope with the, the, uh, the mailing process, the tracking of appropriate data to even know who is sending what and even the delivery process. So let's not, we shouldn't even go there. So, so what I would think, yes, voting. what I would think is that even the electronic voting process given the state of our society, because yes, we might admire a lot of what has happened in the US, but we'll also be realistic enough to know the state of our development in Nigeria, the state of our infrastructure, the, the degree of education of our average voter in Nigeria. So what, we would, what I would be advocating is that the, the Electoral Act should at least provide options. So for example, like what we have seen in the US, there was the option of uh, voting in person, and there is also, of course, the option of mailing voting, and that's left to the preference of the voters. That sort of thing in Nigeria should happen, that for most people within the lower middle class, upper middle class, I'm sure a lot of people would prefer to key into the electronic voting system, provided we can ensure its security, safety, accuracy, and all of those things, and prevent all sorts of uh, adulteration that could happen in the, in the process. And then those who choose to also vote by the traditional voting system of going to stand in line, you know, cast the ballot just as, it's, as, as we've been used to, they should also be, have that opportunity because most of our citizens, we, we cannot enfranchise citizens who, for example, are not, uh, we don't have access, access to uh, ICT infrastructure and all of those things, which is not the fault of the citizens. Obviously, it's the fault of governance in Nigeria over the, over the years. But I think that if you look, for example, I, I can speak for the, uh, uh, the profession that I, I, I belong, that's the, the legal profession. We just saw the, uh, 
the, M the, the, the NBA election that just concluded a, yeah. a couple of months ago, it was an electronic voting system. Heavily disputed. Heavily well. disputed, though. <laughs> but what we have seen is that that sort of outcome that we saw in that election probably would not have been possible if we were still voting Doing. in a manual way yes. and if we were not adopting universal suffrage as we have adopted. And I believe that, uh, yeah, you know, for example, uh, those of us in the studio here, we probably would be more comfortable staying in the comfort of our, of our homes, our offices, and voting from there, provided we are sure that the vote will indeed be counted and it will indeed count. So what yeah. INEC should be looking at is ensuring that we create those myriad of options including even diaspora voting. Like I saw in the U.S. election that people, even you know, military uh, officers serving overseas had opportunity to send in diaspora their votes and all of those sort of things. So those are the kind of things we should be talking about. But it cannot be one size fits, fits all. all. And so the U.S. has mail-in votes. And then so we then go to our moribund postal service and we say we are adopting that. We are all going to be in trouble <laughs> after the election. <laughs> okay. So it's not advisable. Uh, I'm, I'm still talking numbers. I still want to you know, push the same question. Uh, Aside the... The uh, fact that uh, the U.S. electoral uh, system was able to accommodate 160 million, you know, plus people, 66.9 percent, uh, once again. Um, and speaking now, uh, Mr. Emeka um what also do you think that we as p people, as Nigerians, should learn from the need to participate in the electoral process to be able to unseat, as it seems, a sitting U.S. president? Uh, what what can we learn from that? And how much faith do you think that we should have in our own electoral process? If you remember in the past, there's been uh, calls by certain persons asking people to boycott elections and, and the likes. How important, um, what do, do the U.S. elections show us about the importance of participating in the process? Hey, we've um, done it before, right? We've taken out an incumbent president in Nigeria. So... Um, I think I think a lot of it has to do with the uh, nonchalance. Let's put it that way. And, and you can can blame the average Nigerian uh, when you look at the history of politics in Nigeria, uh, what the politicians have, have done with the mandate that Nigerians uh, have given them in the past. Uh, so there's this apathy. Um, the, the average politician out there, I, I don't know how many Nigerian politicians are, are, are in there to, to serve the people. So the people uh, don't really see the need to go out and, and, make, and, and do civic duty, which is, which is critical for, for our development. But I think that's, that's one of the growing pains in, in the democracy. We hold on it. I will get to that point where the average citizen sees it as a, as a civic right and a civic duty to, to go and vote um, the right person. But uh, the system needs to, needs to be overhauled first. We have to, the, the, the whole political process needs to be uh, re-looked at and overhauled. We need to, we need to agree on the best platform for each political party to uh, to. To, to raise somebody, to make people emerge. Right now, um, I don't think we're presenting our best people. I don't think the right people are emerging in our part, political parties. That's a lot of money uh, that comes to play in Nigerian politics. Even as little, as, as low as local government chairman position, uh, millions are spent uh, to, to get that ticket. Something, something is wrong with our process. We need to look at that and then maybe credible candidates, uh, when credible candidates start you know, starts showing up for elections, people... All right, uh, let's come back to you in the studio, Mr. Well, Ibiladi. The, the issue of we've, we've talking about this for, I can't remember how long now, yes. independent candidacy. In this U.S. election, we know that a Nigerian-American contested as an independent candidate and won. You know, how soon do you think we can gravitate to have individuals participate in our election and have a fair chance of winning? That, that, that's why the starting point for my uh, introductory comments was the Electoral Act. That provision has to be made into our laws and also has to be made into the Constitution, which is the foundation of all laws. As it stands today, you cannot run for uh, public office in Nigeria without belonging 
to a political party. So that's a critical legal impediment to, to the idea of in the, uh, a, an independent candidacy. And so that's very important that the constitution has to accommodate that, the electoral act has to accommodate that. So the starting point is to you know, put the appropriate pressures on the national assembly and respective states of assembly and of course the executive uh, arm of government represented overall by the president to ensure that this sort of provision finds footing in our laws and then the conversation can, only then can citizens take advantage of, of, of all of that. And one last point I, I, I want to make regarding all of these interesting things that we have been watching about the US is also that beyond the elections, it's also the question of governance. I mean, there's this cliche that you, you campaign in, in poetry and then you, you run oh. government in prose or <laughs> vice versa. That we have seen that the uh, president-elect, uh, 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 Joe Biden, Biden, has already started to name persons that would serve in his administration. I saw this morning that he has already even outlined the first the five. Coronavirus yes, exactly. Team. The first five executive orders he would be implementing right from, uh, you know, signing into uh, action but from January. I've seen him begin to mention the persons who will lead specific aspects of the immediate responses he wants to have in healthcare and all of this sort of thing, the economy and all. So that beyond looking at the electoral process, which is critical and central to governance. But again, after the elections, the important thing is to get to work and work every day for the, for people. the people. And we also need to learn that from... from, right. uh, from, from, um, well, from we're told yeah. we have very limited yeah. time. So I have a question. Um, I hope that the two of you can respond to it uh, as quickly. I'll start with um, Mr. Ezia Konwa. I, I want to want you to speak on the... Uh, now that we know that Joe Biden has uh, gotten... Uh, I mean, the required percentage and would most likely be declared winner of the election. We, we want to revisit the conversation about Okonjo Iweala for the World Trade um, Organization. Uh, there's been uh, this anticipation that if Trump wins, every likelihood is there that she might not um, get through. And we know that the meeting that was supposed to be held to discuss this was postponed. Now that we have Joe Biden in the seat of power, hopefully, by January. What chances are there for um, Okonjo Iweala? Do you see it as a done deal, or do you still see bottleneck stopping her from becoming uh, the chairman of the World Trade Organization? I honestly think uh, Trump or no Trump, uh, Okonjo Iweala has a very good chance of being the next DG. Um, she's got tremendous support everywhere else except Trump. Uh, but, you know, like you rightly pointed out, I don't, I don't think that's, he has bigger problems right now. Uh, that, that issue, it's, uh, it, it's, it's taken a back, you know, a back time for him at this point. So I, I don't, I don't see him spending too much energy on, on trying to stop Ngozi at this point. Uh, Joe, Joe Biden coming in definitely helps. Uh, but even without that, I, 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 I don't think like he had, he had too much to do. I want you to add to that. Okay. Um, I, saw, I saw a narrative um, a couple of days ago about what Joe Biden's presidency means for the Nigerian government. And if uh, truly uh, the uh, support and the congratulatory messages you know, were you know, from the belly or you know, just surface. Um, if you remember a couple of years ago, the um, Joe Biden and Obama presidency, of course, helped um, or assisted with uh, uh, the government's um, fight against terrorism. Yes. There's going to be a scorecard, you know, a couple of years later. Now that Joe Biden is in power, uh, there will be questions raised about, you know, um, what was done with the funds that were released and the support that was given back then. Um, do you think that Nigeria stands any has anything to benefit generally from? Uh, Joe Biden being in the White House. Well, I I, I think that um, the the most important thing for us is to know that as as, a, as Nigerians is that the world would not build Nigeria. We, as citizens of Nigeria, as government in Nigeria, will ultimately have to build Nigeria. That responsibility is hundred percent. As as a matter of fact, the world would not respect Nigeria until Nigeria itself is a place that has shown respect to itself, to its citizens in terms of the quality of governance. So for, for, for me, the question of expecting, we shouldn't expect much 
from an American president. The American president essentially has his responsibility to yeah. the American people. And then so our own leaders should focus essentially on ensuring inclusion in our society, ensuring that poverty is reduced. These are, these are things that can be resolved without having to seek uh, imperialist powers and all, of, all, all support and all of that. And then I, 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 I like to take the point on uh, uh, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Weala, and, and that's already the idea that the vast majority of the world is behind her for that position. And then one country appears to be expressly trying to impede that process. What that should show us also is the skewed nature of the international system. We, have, we see it in the UN, we see it with the World Bank, we see it with the IMF, we see it with the structure of most multilateral organizations. But all of this, at the end of the day, is about the balance of power. And power is both economic and military power. So the long-term thing for us is that while we continue to push and hopefully expect that the world will stand behind our own very credible and obviously extremely competent Dr. Ngozi okonjo Wiala. The long-term focus is also to make Nigeria into a country that cannot be easily disrespected by any world power. Uh, and that starts in, with how in, well in, in we In spite of all the shenanigans, yeah. I would people. say, Nigerians continue to thrive. A exactly. In, in, in spite, we saw the case with Adeshina. In spite uh, of We saw all, the case yeah. of some other public figures that you know, are, in, are in the international scene. But right. at the end of the day, somehow, and then you see the force of support that comes from Africa, from Nigerian right. leaders. And in uh, for all our faults, we don't lack that sense of, um, this is a Nigerian, especially in the international yes, we, scene. We Thank don't. you very much, you so uh, much for your thoughts and your time with us. And it's of course, Mr. Emeka Eziakonwa. Thank you very much for coming on The Breakfast. Thank you for having me. Hello. Hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.